السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين Welcome back everyone to تفسير سورة هود Inshallah we're going to uh, have a very special session today uh, with the passing of our dear beloved uh, Shaykh Muhammad al-Sharif our hearts have been extremely uh, saddened we are all in a state of um, uh, you know extreme shock and sadness at the parting of our beloved Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif rahmahullah ta'ala. So inshallah, as soon as this session is over, we are going to have a tribute to our Sheikh. So jazakallah khair to all of those of you that have uh, signed up to speak about um, Sheikh Muhammad and for those that will be attending. Um, okay, so inshallah, we're going to begin at the Surah Hud, verse 15. So that's where we had left off. So we could all turn to Tafsir Surah Hud, verse number 15, Ba'da Algo Billah, Himina Shaytan al Rajim, Bismillah Rahman al Rahim. Man, whosoever Gana wanted or was Yurid, literally, he desires Al Hayat, the life, a dunya of this world, Wazinataha, and its adornment. Noah fi, we grant to lay him towards them or to them, a'malahum, their a'mal, their action, their deeds, fiha, in it, wa and whom they fiha, within it, la shall not, yubkhasun, uh, yani will not have their reward or recompense, not reward, but recompense, diminished in the least. Number, verse number 15, those who merely seek the present world and its adornment, we fully recompense them for their work in this world, and they are made to suffer no diminution in it concerning what is their due. Yani they don't get anything below or anything less than what is due to them in the life of this world. But it is because they desire only the life of this world, and they get just that. So this reverse is referring to those that are satisfied with the pleasures of this world. Then they shall receive what they desired of this dunya without anything being reduced for them. But Shaykh Ta'ala, he mentioned in his tafsir that if you are a believer, that iman inside of you, that which you have of iman within you would never ever allow you to focus your desires, to focus all of your desires and all of your attention on this world only and its temporary gains only. So, uh, also for this verse, Ibn Kathir he mentions a report regarding those people who did good deeds, but they did them to be shown off, to be seen by others. So they were also targeting this world as uh, a reward or a recompense. They wanted the fame of this world or the good praise from people in this world. They wanted the you know, wealth or other benefits that would come from their actions, which appeared righteous, but their goals were not akhirah. Their goals were not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The goals were not for the lofty palaces of paradise and Allah's pleasure. Rather, the goal was to get attention or fame or whatever that they were seeking in this dunya. So this doesn't um, just apply to people who are completely dunyawi, completely, uh, focused on dunya. It also applies to people who are de doing deeds that appear to be deeds of akhirah, but because their intentions, which are hidden and known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they are marred, because they are scarred, um, they are directed towards the gains of this life, then they also receive uh, their due of uh, this life, but there is no share for them in the akhirah. There is no uh, acceptance of their deeds. Uh, when the deed is not done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they get what they are aiming for, but these deeds do not become rewardable in the next life because they're not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the lesson here for us is what a bad bargain to make. Like how bad do you have to be in making deals to become satisfied with a drop when you could have had the ocean? To be satisfied with dunya is like being satisfied with a drop when you could have had the khayr of dunya and akhira, and akhira is that ocean. And we know this from the hadith of, of the Rasul in the collection of Muhammad Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala, where the Rasul said what means, were this world worth a wing of a mosquito, and referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would not have given a drink of water to an infidel. 
the non-believer would not have had a drink of water even in this dunya if the worth of this world was even that much that a mosquito's wing is worth, which shows how this dunya has absolutely no worth in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, um, you know, the non-believers who don't have iman, who don't believe in Allah and in akhirah have everything. They are the kings, the rulers, the leaders, the wealthiest of uh, people in many, many instances. So that shows how Allah looks at this world, how much worth he attaches to dunya, and then how much worth should we then give? How much priority should we then give to this world, right? Okay, let's look at verse number 16, the next verse, verse 16. Ula'ika, those alladina, again, those ula'ika is referring to uh, farther versus closer. Alladina, those laysa not lahum for them fi in al akhira the hereafter, illa except anar, the fire. Wa and habita, wasted, ma that would sana'u, they did. This is from Sana'a, which is to make, so becomes and was wasted that which they did. Fiha in it wa and baltil vain ma that which canu they used to ya'amalun do. Verse 16. They are the ones who shall have nothing in the hereafter except the fire. There they shall come to know that their deeds in the world had come to naught, and that whatever they had done is absolutely useless okay so this shows the impact of choice this shows how consequences of what we decide to do and not do are so incredibly real right after making a such a bad choice the worst choice right choosing this world over the next forgetting their share of the next world or forgetting the akhira altogether right because we should be desirous of a good share in this world, but mostly focus on the akhira, right? Rabbanatina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana, right? But once people prioritize only this dunya, then the akhira, which was not even a priority, then it, there is no place for them. They did not desire its khair or work for its khair, so then how can they receive a share of that khair? Rather, there is nothing for them except the punishment and all that they had done in this dunya, and for this dunya will vanish away with this dunya because dunya is meant to disappear. The world is meant to fade away. It is not everlasting. So it's a very logical result of their choices. And this is because they did not believe in the akhirah, right? It goes back to Iman Bilyom uh, al-Akhir. This is why it is one of the uh, pillars, one of um, the articles of faith, right? Uh, to believe in Allah and the last day, because if you don't believe in an akhirah, um, this limits your efforts and energies to this dunya only, right? Whereas a believer is the opposite. She has her uh, sight set upon the hereafter. So, you know, from this Quranic um, understanding, we uh, can comprehend the situation of philanthropists who do so much good, spend so much money on such noble causes around the world to alleviate poverty and reduce suffering and work for refugees and so on and so forth. Yet they don't have iman. They are not people of faith. They're not people who affirm an afterlife, who believe in Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So they are amply rewarded with the good of this world in this world. But that prerequisite for deeds to count in the next world is missing. And that prerequisite is Iman. So we are so accepting of prerequisites that are arbitrarily set for certain accomplishments in dunya. For example, let's say you have multiple IT certificates. Okay, you have multiple IT, IT certificates. But you want to apply to a graduate level program and that graduate level program, it requires a college degree. IT certificates, no matter how much money you can make with them are not going to cut it because this graduate program that you're applying to requires a bachelor's, a college degree, right? So regardless of how outstanding your performance was and all of those wonderful certificates, 
you will not be granted admission into the master's programs because the requirement for it is a college degree, is a full-blown bachelor's, right? Now, we accept this prerequisite in the blink of an eye. We don't even question it, right? But why is it that we are doubtful about the requirements of the akhirah? The requirement of the akhirah is iman. So regardless of how many certificates of philanthropy you have in this world, if the iman was not coupled with those acts, then that prerequisite is not met. And that is a prerequisite for deeds to count in the akhirah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they will not reap anything there because they had never sowed uh, the field for the next life, right? Even in this dunya, you would never expect to have a share in uh, the soil of a field that you had never planted in, right? A soil that does not bear your toil will not bear your fruits either, right? I mean, we logically think like this about dunya, then why do we become so unrealistic uh, when it comes to the akhirah? You know, if you haven't planted in the field of the hereafter, how can you reasonably expect something to have grown there of its own accord, you know? Nothing appears magically with our names on it, neither in this world, nor in the next. And we certainly don't expect things to work out like that uh, in this dunya, which is an infinitely less grand world. This dunya is infinitely more insignificant than the akhirah. Yet we don't expect things to magically appear with our names on it. Then why do we uh, think that we shall have grand gardens of akhirah without sowing the seed? So, you know, the lesson is here to be logical, to use your mind and your time, because we shall only reap what we what we sow. Okay, let's look at verse number 17. So the one Kana who was upon ala Kana uh, was ala upon bayina a clear evidence min from Rabbihi, his Lord, Wayatluhu, and follows it Shahid, a witness, Minhu, from him, wa and from woman and from Qablihi before that kitabu book Musa, the book of Musa, Imama a guide wa and Rahma a mercy. Ula ika doz minuna believe bihi in it. Wa and man whoever yakfu disbelieves bihi in it min from al ahzab the various groups for then the fire mawaidu is his meeting place. Fala, so do not taku be, so do not be, fi in mirya, doubt, minhu, from it or regarding it. Innahu, indeed it, al haqqu the truth, min from Rabbika, your Lord, wa and lakin, but akthara, most anas, the people, la do not yu'minun, believe. Verse 17. Can it happen that? He who enjoyed a clear evidence from his Lord, which is subsequently followed by a witness from him in his support. And prior to that was the book of Musa revealed as a guide and a mercy. Would even such a person deny the truth in the manner of those who adore the life of this world? Rather, such persons are bound to believe in it the fire shall be the promised resort of the groups of people that disbelieve. So be in no doubt about it, for this indeed is the truth from your Lord, although most people do not believe. So here the Quran asks a question, can the one who walks on this earth with a clear proof, a bayina from their Lord, be like the one who walks without this light, without this evidence, without this proof. And if you look at the various tafsirs, they have um, different meanings for what is meant by this bayina and what is meant by the shahid, which is also mentioned. So the verse is saying that uh, the bayina that a person is upon and that bayina is followed by a shahid, uh, a witness um, after that bayina. So what is the bayina? What is the clear proof? And what is the shahid? What is that witness that follows the bayina? So if you look at different tafsirs, you will uh, see, for example, Maududi Rahmanullah Ta'ala and others have said that this bayina, this clear evidence or proof is the fitra, 
that the human being is naturally upon. And then the shahid is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or it is the Quran itself. And others like Sheikh Saadi and another Mufassir by the name of Alusi, Rahimallah Ta'ala, they have said that the Bayina is the Quran and uh, Sheikh Saadi mentions that the witness uh, from him uh, that follows the Bayina is the Fitra. And you will have other explanations. Some say it is Jibreel, uh, alayhi salam. Uh, Allah Ta'ala Alam, you will find all these various interpretations and meanings given in tafsir and they do not necessarily clash they can provide um, reinforcing different enriching shades of meaning but Allah alam ta'ala adds that nonetheless what this shows is that even apart from revelation there is ample evidence in man's own self in man's own self I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Okay. So this shows that even apart from revelation, there is ample evidence in man's own self in the structure of the heavens and the earth and in the order that prevails in the universe to prove that God is the only creator, master, Lord, and sovereign of the universe. So basically, if you are upon the sound fitra and you have eyes and ears to observe the phenomena around you, then this evidence itself is going to point to the fact that there is a Lord and he is one and he can be the only one who is the creator and master of this universe. So this is the natural inclination or fitra that Allah subhanahu has created us upon and is one of the greatest internal supports we have for recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like our DNA. And there is a corroborating uh, hadith or, um, you know, a proof from an authentic narration from Sahih Muslim, which basically says the same thing, which means I have created my servants as Hunafa, yani when having a natural inclination to the worship of Allah. Hunafa, we know, is the plural of Hanif, and we learned about uh, Hanif when we talked about Ibrahim, alayhi in our Befriended by God series. He showed the beauty of what it means to be a Hanif, one who is fully focused upon Allah alone, not distracted by any other attachment or distraction. So the narration says in Sahadis al-Qudsi, I've created my servants as Hanafa, but it is shaitan who turns them away from the right religion and he makes unlawful what has been declared lawful for them and he commands them to ascribe partnership with me, although he has no justification for that. This is actually part of a much longer narration. The point being that we are all created upon the fitra, that predisposition to believe, which is already there. Okay, that bayina is already there. That fitra, that bayina, that clear inclination, predisposition to believe is already present. And then the Quran, the shahid, comes after that to further prove and elucidate and explain what you already knew in your heart of hearts to be true. I remember one sister uh, who converted from Christianity when she found Islam and she was so... Uh, her heart was so happy at having discovered Islam and she recognized it. And she said, this is what Christianity was supposed to be. Yani, if it had remained undiluted, not polluted, this would have been the clear, pristine form of the religion revealed uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this verse is, remember, it's asking a question, can one who is upon this bayina, one who has this shahid, his confirmation from the Quran, confirmation from the fitra. Can someone who know what the Quran teaches and affirms his or her fitra, can that individual be like those who choose to remain ignorant, who choose to ignore the calls of their fitra, who choose to not consider the uh, Quranic arguments, right? And we can take this further and Think about ourselves as Muslims, those of us who have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have tasted the serenity of tawakkul, right? And the peace that comes from that reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Can, you know, 
those believers be like the ones that have no such knowledge, have no such comfort, have no such resort and refuge to turn to, right? And again, Allah does not compel anyone to believe. At the same time, disbelief is not without consequence. La ikraha fi din. There is no compulsion religion. You don't have to believe. You don't want to. But your attitude of dismissiveness and neglect is not going to be without consequence, right? The hadith is in Sahih Muslim, what the Rasul Salaam said, what means purity is half of Iman. Alhamdulillah fills the scales, and subhanAllah and Alhamdulillah fill that which is between the heaven and the earth. And the salah is a light, and charity is a proof, and patience is illumination. And the Qur'an is a proof either for you or against you. That is the part of the hadith I wanted to highlight that is directly related to what we are talking about. And the Qur'an is a proof either for you or against you. So yes, you can ignore the Qur'an. You can ignore what Allah says. You can not do what he commands you to do. But the fact that we have it and it's accessible to us and we can read it, it's going to Neglecting it will have consequences. It's either going to be a proof for you or against you. And this is one of the first hadith I ever read decades ago um, that made me understand that how we treat the Quran is going to determine what testimony it gives for me on the day of judgment. It's either going to be a proof in my favor you know, if I try to understand it and inshallah implement it and hopefully, you know, maybe teach it inshallah, or it's going to be a proof against the individual that even though it was before us available, we did not read it or try to understand it or try to implement it, right? And the hadith ends with every person starts his day as a vendor of his soul, either freeing it or causing its ruin, right? Yani, every day we have an opportunity to make the right choices that will lead to pleasurable, delightful consequences. Or we can make the wrong choices and we can neglect the Quran and neglect opportunities for the and good deeds and just, um, you know, ruin our time on earth and cause ruin to our akhirah as well. So what is the prescription that Allah gives in this verse regarding uh, the Quran here in verse number 18? And so do not be in doubt concerning about about it you know don't be in any doubt whatsoever about the quran about the uh, revelation the cure is to know that it is the truth from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the cure of doubt is to know that it is to believe that it is indeed from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. we've provided so many proofs in our classes of how the quran has to be from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how it is divine in nature how the quraish although they had the most to gain the most to lose by not being able to come up with something like the Quran, we're still unable to do so, which points to its divine nature, and it's called Ijaz al Quran. So, not to harbor doubt, the word midya here is related to, uh, it is, is used for doubt, it's related to the word for argument as well, mira. And it has to do with the concept of taking something that is sound and causing um, doubts regarding it. So a sound concept, a sound religion, a sound Salim way of life that is upon the fitrah, and then poking holes in it, trying to make it seem unreasonable, trying to um, you know, make it unpopular or uh, offering alternatives to it after creating those doubts. You know, that sounds very, very familiar to what is going on uh, around us today. So realize that this is something that the mushrikeen try to do and the tactics of today are not very different uh, when it comes to trying to poke holes and suggest alternative uh, alternatives to um, the lifestyle of the fitra and so on. So something to really be um, perceptive regarding. Okay, let's look at verse number 18. Wa and man who is more oppressive or more unjust mimman than the one iftara who invents ala upon Allah upon Allah kadiba 
upon Allah Eli. Ulaika, those yu'raduna shall be presented ala upon Rabbihim, their Lord. Wa and yaqulu, he will and will say, who will say al ashhad? The witnesses will say, Haula, these alladina are the ones kadabu who denied or lied ala upon Rabbihim, who lied upon their Lord. Ala ne la'ana. The curse of Allah, the curse of Allah ala upon al-ghalimin, the unjust or the oppressive ones. So verse number 18, and who is a greater wrongdoer than he who invents a lie against Allah? Such persons will be set forth before their Lord and the witnesses will testify. These are the ones who lied against their Lord. Lo, Allah's curse be upon the wrongdoers. So when it it's so asking, you know, who is more unjust than the one who invents a lie upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It means no one else is more unjust. This is the most unjust category of people, right? The most oppressive, unjust type of people are the ones who invent lies against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, lying is bad enough, but it's even worse when it's against the Lord of the worlds. And how horrible will be the consequences of that behavior when these people have to face up to their deeds for that audacious behavior when they shall be presented before their Lord. You know, so what does it mean to lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It could be to make up lies or doubts concerning the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can be, you know, detracting, um, distracting people away uh, from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make it more, making it less popular or less palatable or less uh, appealing, you know, anything that is done um, to bar others from the way uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, through inventing lies, etc., about his deen. And so Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his tafsir, he mentions, it is as if this ayah is saying who will be more severely punished than this group of people. Yani, this most unjust group of people out of all of mankind is also going to be the most severely punished group of people in the akhirah. And what does it mean that they'll be presented before their Lord, presented in order to be asked about their deeds and know that whoever was asked and challenged um, regarding their deeds by Allah subhanahu wa is, is ruined, right? So the lesson here for us is that, is one we should never forget that we will all have to face our deeds, whether they're good or bad. This is the one and only thing that you can never ever run away from. On the day of judgment, everyone will be running away from their dearest uh, ones, their parents, their children, their spouses. But the one thing you will not be able to run away from will be your own deeds. Like our DNA is to us in dunya, that's how our deeds will be to us in the akhirah. It will be, they will be our identity. They will be the ultimate determinants of where we wind up. So like our DNA is to us in dunya, that's how our deeds will be to us in the akhirah. That is what we will be known by. And you know, that time is very, very near when we are going to be in complete aloneness with our deeds, that our only companion will be our deeds. That time is very close as the death of Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, when I still say it, I still cannot get used to it, uh, that, you know, that he's no longer here, but that he in fact has completed his book of deeds because the book is sealed with death. After that, we cannot make any entry of Hasanat. We cannot make a single entry of Hasanat. And it was said that someone was, you know, once asked, this is a story, it's not a narration, it's not a report, but just to emphasize how valuable time and the ability to do good really is, is that if you were to ask a person in their grave, if you were to be given one minute in this world, if you were allowed to come back and live for one minute only, in this world, you know, what would you do? And the person replies, I would fill it with subhanAllah. I'd fill it with subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, or a smile on the face of your brother or sister or parents or 
um, siblings or, you know, do, uh, you know, an act of, to, to speak kindly instead of, um, you know, frowning and uh, to give, uh, to say kalima tayyiba, right? Instead of withholding those uh, good kind words, like they would fill up that one minute with as much as they possibly could because they know the value of that minute, what it translates into because death is that seal after which you cannot make a single entry of hasanat or delete a single sin through toba. You cannot upload any more videos of uh, khair or seek forgiveness for insulting people or hurting people or making people feel uncomfortable or unwelcome. You won't be able to do any of those things. So this is why we cannot overemphasize the importance of what we choose to do, of what I fill my day with, of what I think of when I wake up, of what I'm going to do, of what I plan to do the next day if Allah gives me life. This is why it's so important to self-assess how distracted or focused am I on my goal for this world and the next. So really, what our goal and focus should be for the rest of our lives, how much ever is remaining of our life, we have to make sure that these deeds that we are about to become alone with, we want to make sure that they were pleasant companion, right? If you were given the choice, choose anyone you want to be with, uh, you know, for the rest of your life, and you can only choose one person, you would be with them for the rest of your days. You would choose someone who was pleasant, who was cordial, who was, uh, you know, someone who made you feel comfortable, someone who brought you light. So, our deeds are really that only companion. They're the true companion that enter, because they enter uh, the grave with us. So we better make sure it's a, they're a pleasant companion, a fragrant companion whose company and scent sweetens our graves. And subhanAllah, again, our beloved Shaykh Muhammad al-Sharif, rahimahullah ta'ala, who is buried there now in Al-Quza Cemetery in Dubai, Sheikh Isa, when he was doing the um, you know video for him from that cemetery, he mentioned how when they were praying him for burial, there was a smile on his face. Allah Taala, you know, all such a beautiful indication of his husn uh, khatima, inshallah. So we want to do deeds that make us smile or will make us smile at that moment of death. We want to do those deeds that is going to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala smile upon us as we walk on this earth. We want Allah's rida before we die. We want Allah's pleasure. We want Allah to be pleased with us while we're walking on this earth and doing uh, the deeds which make up our akhirah, right? And we hope that he covers up our uh, sins on the day of judgment because what this verse is talking about, يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَى رَبِّهِمْ Those who will be presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask about their deeds, they will then be exposed. They will then be exposed, right? Versus the believer will be covered up, right? There's also a meeting of the believer on the day of judgment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to him or her privately and does not expose their sins, even though everyone has sins, right? So um, the narration actually is in Bukhari where Safwan tells about the time he was speaking, he was walking with Ibn Umar and he was holding his hand and a man came in front of us, he says, and asked, what have you heard from Allah's messenger? Uh, about a najwa. A najwa is the secret talk, yani the secret conversation that is going to happen on the day of judgment between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the good soul, the good believer, right? And so Ibn Umar said, and look how keen they were, right? When they found an opportunity, they found someone who knew more than them. They were keen to find out something that was going to benefit their akhirah. So this is the kind of attitude we should have. You know, instead of finding out things for our dunya and things that will bring us pleasure and entertainment and, you know, um, uh, you know increase us in physical beauty, et cetera, we should really be focused on what's going to increase our uh, beauty in the next life, right? So... Ibn Umar said, I heard Rasulullah saying, Allah will bring a believer near him and shelter him with his screen and ask him, did you commit such and such sins? He will say, yes, my Lord. Allah will keep on asking him till he will confess all his sins and will think that he is ruined. 
Allah will say, I did screen your sins in the world and I forgive them for you today. And then he'll be given the book of his good deeds. Regarding infidels and hypocrites, their evil lives will be exposed publicly. And the witnesses will say, and then he recited this verse, right? These are the people who lied against their Lord. Behold, the curse of Allah is upon the wrongdoers. This verse that we're doing right now, verse number 18. So that is going to be the case of the disbeliever. Just like you have witnesses of Allah on earth, which are the people that witness about a person after their death, so shall the next life have its witnesses, which are called al-ashhad here in this verse, which is the plural of shaheed or shahid. And these witnesses of the next world are going to be the angels we're writing down. Our deeds, every single one of them, every word that we say, every deed that we do, as well as the prophets. So in the next life, the witnesses are the angels and the prophets. And they're going to testify against these individuals who had invented lies against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so this is the part of the verse that we're talking about. So the witnesses will say that these are the ones who lied upon their Lord and the curse of Allah shall be upon these. So instead of the pleasure of Allah, the ridwan of Allah, the curse of Allah, will be upon these people. And these are those that are obviously upon kufr, right? Or those who have no interest in believing in the akhirah, who have no priority or focus on the akhirah, right? Maududi rahimahullah he explains in the present context, the verse means that those who are overly infatuated with the allurements of a worldly life will be inclined to reject the message of the Quran. Yeah, and if your focus is just dunya and you're just so taken by it, you're just so, uh, you know, it just has taken over your senses, your imagination, your hopes, your aspirations are all about this world. You're not going to be interested in the message of the Quran, right? But then Maududi mentions that the opposite of that mindset, distinguishable from these, are those who take full note of the testimony furnished by their own beings, any those who pay attention to their fitrah, and by the structure and order prevailing in the universe. Along with the fitrah, they also contemplate Allah's signs in a way that reinforces their recognition of him, in a way that brings them closer to him. So, you know, all these summer vacations we may be taking or trips we may go on or beautiful sights we may see, this is what they should serve. This is the purpose they should serve for us, right? Is that they get us closer to, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, showing us his might, his grandeur, his beauty. This testimony was further reinforced by the heavenly books revealed before, uh, in, before the Quran, right? So the third testimony is the Kitab of Musa, the book that Musa -Islam was given in the, the Torah. So how could such persons close their eyes to such overwhelming testimony as this and join their voice with those of the unbelievers? Okay, so that is a question to think about. Verse 19, we're going to learn more about the characteristics of those people upon whom is Allah's curse who are described as the most unjust of people who will be the most severely punished. Verse number 19, those yasudduna who block and from Sabilillah, the path of Allah, and seek awaja, seek to make it crooked. Wahum and they bil akhira regarding the akhira, whom they are kafir, they are disbelievers. Upon those, so who is the curse of Allah upon? Upon those who bar, who stop people from the way of Allah and seek in it crookedness and disbelieve in the hereafter okay so these are the people under allah's curse yani and who have uh, his punishment because whenever the curse of allah is upon someone it implies his punishment the punishment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so number one and i want to go through their characteristics to make sure that we are the opposite of them so that upon us inshallah will be the ridwan of allah the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so number one they block the path to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mama tabari Rahmanullah Ta'ala in his tafsir, he says that they block the path to Iman. They 
blocked the acknowledgement that only Allah has the right to Abudiya to be worshipped. It is not my desires. It is not my society. It is not other allegiances uh, that have priority, but that Allah alone has the right to be worshipped. Okay, so blocking the path to Iman and blocking the path to this acknowledgement of Allah's soul a right to be worshipped is someone who is blocking from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, just think of our society, think of our culture, how it has made it less and less attractive and more and more outdated to live a godly life, right? How following deen as a way of an organized life uh, feeling accountable to a higher authority, how these things are becoming less and less attractive, more and more outdated, less and less relevant, right? Who, what makes up the culture? It's the people. It's the ideas they promote. It's the things they talk about. It's the way they live as if they don't have someone who has the full right to dictate to them what to do and what to eat and what not to eat. Isn't that halal and haram of food? What to wear and what not to wear. Yes, our deen does give us very clear guidelines about how we can dress. The Quran is not silent on this issue. Yes, there is a lot of flexibility, but no one can claim that there are no guidelines. No one can make the claim that there are, you know, I can do whatever I want to do. You do you is not Quranic. You do what your creator, who you're going back to, tells you to do, right? So we have to think about the kind of ideas that are being championed, the kind of ideals that are being championed around us and you know what their opposite looks like, what the Quran says regarding that. And realize and identify as people you know, with sharp minds, realize and be able to identify who it is that nowadays in our times is making the path to Allah look crooked, right? Uh, because that's the second description, right? Um, that they seek to make it crooked. They want to make the straight path look crooked, look outdated. It doesn't work anymore. That was for a thousand years ago. It, it's it's not uh, practical anymore, right? So seeking to make you know that which is straight, crooked, seeking to make that which is salim and sounded upon the fitra to make that look like, you know, to poke holes in it and offer alternatives according to one's own, uh, the concoctions, concoctions of one's own mind. So we need to be able to identify, you know, uh, you know who is doing this and or what these trends look like, right? Uh, what, what, are, what are these systems that uh, seek to make a less path crooked? What uh, what do their voices sound like today? What are their what are their arguments and ideas sound like today? So that we don't unknowingly succumb to them like sheep. So we just don't follow all the trends around us just because they are there, just because we're born into the society and culture, right? Because sometimes these trends and messages can be as subtle as the air that we breathe. And before you know it, it's already inside of us, inside of our heads, and we're seeing and understanding through it, thinking it's your independent understanding, although if you just think a little bit deeper and compare it to the Quranic paradigm, you'll be able to quickly realize and only then only be able to quickly realize that you had indeed been infiltrated without even realizing. This is why Quranic study is so important. There's no other filter, there's no other way to distinguish uh, the difference between what is being offered to us around us, what we're influenced by without even knowing it, how we're already thinking, what thought patterns we have developed without even realizing it. And to compare that against the Quran, because that is what Allah wants from us, right? And the third description is that they disbelieved in the Akhirah, right? And with regards to the Akhirah, they have, you know, they have doubts about it. They don't believe in it, reject it all together. The concept of, you know, day of judgment, of a reckoning, of being accountable for your deeds before God, it sounds so irrelevant, uh, you know, in today's day and age. It's not even an afterthought, right? Rather, YOLO, right? You only live once. You do you mentality. You know, that is what leads the day. So the lesson is we want to be the opposite of these descriptions. We want to be the opposite of those people upon whom is Allah's curse who have these uh, two descriptions given here. So what we want to do to be the opposite, number one, is we don't want to block 
to Allah's way, right? We don't want to block the path to Allah's path. Rather, we want to call to Allah's way. We want to call others to the way of Allah, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلَ مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحَ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Right? And who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah and does acts of righteousness and says that indeed I am from among those who submit. Right? A Muslim by definition is the one who submits and does not question, right? The one who trusts in the wisdom of the one he is submitting to over his own inclinations and desires. Number two, to be the opposite of those who make the path crooked is we want to make the path to Allah clear. We want to make it simple. We want to make it easy to understand. We want to show how logical it is. And uh, it is something that our fitra already calls us to, right? And number three, there were uh, disbelievers with regard to the akhirah or, you know, or in doubt about it disbelieving in it, we want to harbor certainty, not just by saying, I believe in it, but by aligning your actions with that belief, because that is real belief, right? That is the sidq and the yaqeen that leads to high ranks in the akhirah, right? And part of this, part of living, uh, part of this is living life every day, ready to die. And that's a tall order, to be able to live life every day, ready to die is really when we have yaqeen about the akhirah. Yaqeen about the akhirah is not saying I believe in the akhirah, but when you act like you can enter into the akhirah at any moment, right? And subhanAllah, it is said about the salaf that if you were to tell them that you have 24 hours left to live, if you were to tell them that you have one day left to live on this earth, they would not be able to change their schedule. Because it was, subhanAllah, it was already packed and or filled or illuminated by everything that they were supposed to be doing anyway, subhanAllah. And again, this reminds me of our beloved Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, who was always talking about death. Uh, he had a certain life experience that put him in a mindset where he was always ready to die. And in a clip that's being circulated be, these days, he talks about once... This is not the life experience that put him in this mindset, but this happened after that particular life experience. The, he was in a classroom with about 60 people or so when the lights went out and he just started saying, La, you know, like intuitively, instinctively, you know, La ilaha illallah. and after the lights came back, people were asking him, how is it that I have 60 people? You're the only one who said La ilaha illallah, right? Um, so subhanAllah, he was already in that state. He was in that state where, you know, um, as you said in one of his other uh, clips is that, you know, you can die in an instant. You can, how long does it take to die? He asks in that clip, right? He says you can die in an instant. It can take a second to die, subhanAllah. And then look at subhanAllah the way he died. ta'ala. So believing in the akhirah is not saying I believe in the akhirah. It's acting like I believe in the akhirah, which implies, includes being ready to die, living life every day ready to die, which is a tall order. Okay, let's look at verse 20. Ula'ika, those lam, not yakunu, will not be mu'jizina, able to frustrate fi in al-ard, the earth, wa and ma, not gana, were lahum for them, min, from, Dunillah, other than Allah, min of awliya, helpers or allies. Yudha'afu shall be doubled, lahum, for them, al adab, the punishment. Ma, not, can, were able to, yastuti'un, that's actually able to, they were not able to. Asama'a, listen, asama, literally the hearing, wa and ma, not, can, were, yubusirun, able to see. Verse 20. They had no power to frustrate Allah's plan on earth, nor did they have any protectors against Allah. Their punishment will be doubled. They were unable to hear, nor could they see. So this is putting in perspective, um, you know, the long-term state of the people who today are maybe denying the akhirah and may be very powerful people, maybe very affluent 
uh, you know, maybe very affluent seeming right now, but they are not going to be able to outdo Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his earth. They're not going to be able to frustrate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his earth, nor in his heavens, nor in the akhirah. You know, like they say, if you want to sin against Allah, go do it in a place where he can't see you or can't hear you or a place that is not his. If you want to disobey him, do it in a place that does not belong to him. How are you going to live on his earth and then disobey the very master of that earth, right? And again, think about it very logically in terms of dunya. How long do you think you can hold down a job while consistently going against the instructions of your boss? How long do you think you're going to have that job, right? We don't question compliance at all to our boss's instructions, right? We fully, wholeheartedly accept that as part of the job contract. No one questions that we're going to have to follow our boss. We're going to have to listen to our boss, right? We don't question compliance whatsoever to the boss's instructions. Yet we question obedience to the Lord of the worlds, to Lord of the Arshad al to to the Lord, the Lord of the great throne. We question him and his religion, and if it makes sense, and how is it relevant, and how is it practical, right? And why do I have to obey Allah, and you know, why do I have to be the way he wants me to be, and dress the way he wants me to dress, right? We question obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we question obedience to those he has commanded us to obey, the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our parents, our, our husbands, right? So we question everyone when we feel like it, but no one questions that you have to listen to your boss, that you have to follow your boss. Like how inconsistent, uh, you know, is that? How far uh, from faith and Islam submissiveness is that, that we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because as this verse highlights, when you are against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not going to be able to outdo him on his earth. You will have no helpers against him on his earth, nor any support of his will come to you from the heavens. Look at the folly and the foolishness of choosing to go up against him, which is the practical choice a person makes when they choose a life of sin over a life of remembrance, when they choose a life of disobedience and negligence over a life of obedience and submission. You're really choosing to go up against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his earth, right? So for such people, as the verse mentioned, the people that are described in this verse, for such people, the punishment shall be doubled. And what is referenced as one of the reasons for why and how this happened to them is that they did not use their sight and their hearing as they should have, right? Sheikh Saadi mentions in this tafsir how they hated the truth so much that they could not even bear listening to it, right? And I was telling someone, it's easy to dismiss something when you disagree with it, right? Our culture wholeheartedly encourages disagreement. You have the right to your opinion. You can disagree. You don't have to agree with anyone. You can disagree with those that are older than you, younger than you, more knowledge than you, wiser than you. You can disagree with anyone you want. You have the full right to your opinion, right? This is what we are taught. But we are not taught to contemplate, to consider, you know, who is telling you, what are they basing it on? You know, it's easy to dismiss and disagree. It is much harder to consider and contemplate and try to comprehend and use our hearing and our sight properly. And this is one of the reasons that led the people of the fire to the fire. They misused their faculties. Just like in the Quran and Surah Al-Mulk, you have what the people of the fire will say, The people of the fire will lament, if only we had listened and reasoned, we would not be among the residents of the blaze, of the blazing fire. So not using our hearing and our seeing, and our minds and our faculties of understanding, not using these properly, will lead to the wrong conclusions, will lead to leaving behind the wrong kind of legacy, like Maudid Ta'ala points out, that these people that will suffer punishment for being in error 
and for misleading others and leaving behind a legacy of error and misguidance for coming generations, right? The culture we have right now, it's built upon the previous generation that came before it, right? So using our hearing, our sight, our minds, these blessings, they come with the responsibility. And gratitude for these blessings is by using them responsibly, using them to recognize and acknowledge the one who gave them to you, and then to make it your business to find out what he wants you to do with these blessings, how he wants you to use your mind and your hearing and your sight. And that first responsibility on us is to find out what he said in the book, through the book that he sent to us. There's no other way to find out what Allah wants from us, guys. This is it. It's the Quran. There's no other way we can find out what he wants us to do except through his words, which he directly revealed to the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then gave that uh, sunnah, that blessed sunnah of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to show us how to fully implement his teachings and to love the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So next time we are tempted to disagree because we can next time we are tempted to dismiss because we can and it is easy to do so remember that you can always be dismissive and disagree with uh, people um, and, and here I'm speaking about people that are more knowledgeable than us who are wiser than us who uh, have the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah who have our best interest in mind you know perhaps it is not in our best interest to dismiss the uh, thoughts and advice of these people just because we can disagree, but to consider carefully because that reasoning, that consideration, that listening um, and misusing those faculties is one of the things that shall lead to a lot of regret for many people uh, in the Akhira, for those people that we reference in Surah Al-Mulk, right? Who would regret not having used their listening and reasoning properly, and we seek refuge in Allah's Kanda from being from the um, inhabitants of the fire. Allah Majid Nam and Nam, Allah's Kanda to protect us from uh, the fire of hell. But this is self testimony from Ahlul Nar, from the residents of the fire, about what an eternal disaster. You know, what an eternal disaster to not have used Allah's blessings of listening and understanding and hearing properly. May Allah subhanahu wa protect us from such an end and allow us to use all of his blessings, including our hearing, our sight, our seeing, our minds in a way that leads to him, to his obedience, to his pleasure, and not to uh, our own nafs. Subhanahu wa bihamdika la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiru wa natubu ilayka.